Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I know many people had a late night with the many uh, Telegram-based dinners. And uh, today, I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin as a new asset class. And to structure the talk, I'm going to be using a white paper that I put out while I was at ARK Investment Management, which was the first public fund manager to buy into Bitcoin in 2015. And I put out that white paper with Adam White, who I believe is here today, uh, head of GDAX. And we made the claim that Bitcoin was ringing the bell for a new asset class. And to make that claim, we uh, surveyed a lot of the academic literature out there because uh, the definition of an asset class is a notoriously fuzzy subject. And we created a framework against which we could test Bitcoin against all the other asset classes and see if it was falling into a pattern that would make it look like currencies or equities or bonds or whatever it may be. And when we put out the paper, we got a fair amount of fanfare, but we also got a lot of pushback. And when I think about why we got a lot of pushback, um, we published the paper uh, right there when the aggregate network value of crypto assets was $10 billion. And so it was warranted that many people said, hey, asset classes uh, are in the trillions of dollars, and this asset class will never get there. It's $10 billion. Well, we are now 30x later. We are at $300 billion, uh, a third of the way to a trillion. And uh, interestingly enough, I'm starting to feel a little uneasy. Um, but we will talk about that at the end of the conversation and where to next for this asset class. In terms of the structure of my talk today, uh, I'm going to be covering the different framework components that we investigated in the paper. So investi uh, investability, political economic features, correlation of returns, and risk reward profile. And again, I'll be comparing Bitcoin to many of our traditional asset classes like equities, bonds, real estate, precious metals, and also investigating how we're seeing um, this new asset class mature in terms of volatility and liquidity. So let's start with investability, which is an admit admittedly made up word. Um, but here is Bitcoin's daily trading volumes over time, uh, over the last several years. It's a log scale, um, so it's growing faster than, than it may first appear. Over the last 50 days, Bitcoin has averaged well over a billion dollars um, traded globally. And it's probably even much higher than that when you consider the OTC desks and that polling uh, numbers and data from a lot of the exchanges is not cohesive yet. Um, in, in 2017, we're averaging about $1.4 billion um, traded globally. And so we can see the progression is there, right? And this is just Bitcoin. Ether is consistently billion plus daily. The asset class as a whole is frequently over 10 billion. And so this is really just a check, right? Is this asset sufficiently liquid to um, warrant calling it a new asset class and, and getting access to it? Moving on from this metric, we get into one of the first components of the political economic profile, which is supply curves. Um, Bitcoin, on the left here, um, has a disinflationary going on deflationary supply curve. And Bitcoin's monetary policy is mathematically metered by software, which is maintained by 400 plus developers all around the world, similar to how Linux is maintained. So in July of 2016, we had Bitcoin's annual rate of supply inflation drop from 8% to 4%, which I would argue had some, uh, uh, is somewhat to do with the strong bull market of 2017, that, that supply shock. In 2020, that will cut from 4% to 2%. 2024, 2% to 1%. 2028, 1% half a percent. So on and so forth as we converge upon 21 million units. Now, people frequently compare Bitcoin to gold. And turns out the supply schedule actually looks nothing like gold. Um, sorry to break it to the gold bugs, but Bitcoin, uh, gold's supply schedule is actually slightly inflationary. Each year, we, pour, we pull more gold out of the ground than the year before it. If you look at the last century of supply inflation of gold, it oscillates between 1% to 2% a year, um, again, making it slightly inflationary, while Bitcoin is disinflationary going on deflationary. 
We already have 80% of the Bitcoin outstanding right now, and roughly 3 million of them have already been lost forever. So more scarcity than meets the eye. I just show this to show how different the supply schedule um, of Bitcoin is from one of the assets that it is most commonly compared to. There's great variety in the supply schedules of many crypto assets, but most of them, at least the good ones, are, are mathematically metered. Supply is great, but not if it's being used. Um, and so how is Bitcoin being used and how much is it being used? This is a graph showing Bitcoin's um, transaction vol uh, volumes per minute. I need to stress the difference between transaction volumes and trading volumes. Um, trading volumes, which I showed before, happen within the exchanges, uh, within the order books, the, the matching of the bid and the ask, within those isolated liquidity pools. Transacting volume happens on Bitcoin's blockchain. It's the utility of Bitcoin's blockchain. It is the money over IP that is moving value around the world. You can think of, for example, trading volumes as global FX volumes and transacting volumes as the GDP of Bitcoin as we move around value. So average in 2017 is half a million dollars a minute, which is 5x what it was in 2016 and 10x what it was in 2015. People will, will then say, oh, but it's all nefarious activity. And that's an overplayed and outdated story. There's a white paper put out by Germany Central Bank, London School of Economics, University of Wisconsin-Madison, I think it was put out last year, where it looks at um, Bitcoin's network over time and identifies three distinct eras. The first era were really the nerds and the miners and the cryptographers just figuring out, does this experiment work? The second era uh, was the, the sin activities. Uh, criminals are often the earliest adopters of the best technologies. Um, and with Silk Road being the most well-known. And we have since moved into the third era of legitimate enterprises and legitimate use of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not anonymous. It's pseudonymous. It's perfectly tracked. If you want to buy a kilo of cocaine, you're probably better off using cash than Bitcoin. <laughs> Next, people say, oh, but Bitcoin is just a speculative instrument. And again, we can look at those numbers. So. Um, I've already given Bitcoin 2017 uh, annual uh, daily trading volume at 1.4 billion and daily transacting volume at 750 million. That yields a ratio just under two of trading to transacting. If we look at global fiat currency and we use a low, a conservative estimate of 3 trillion daily in the FX markets, uh, 250 trading days in a year, that's 750 trillion is traded in the global FX markets a year. You divide that by projections for GDP this year of 80 trillion, and you get a ratio that looks more like 10. So actually, fiat currency is much more speculated upon than Bitcoin is as a function of its underlying uh, utility. And I actually expect Bitcoin, this ratio, to increase. Um, you know, CME futures coming out. There's all kinds of institutional interest and institutional products. And that, I would argue, will be good for uh, decreasing the volatility of these markets and increasing Bitcoin's use as a currency. Next, I'm going to turn to correlations. This is really a dead giveaway. So this is a, um, a graph from the book I recently published. This is a dead giveaway on how new this asset class and how different it is from the other capital market assets. Um, you know, this is an average of um, rolling correlations over the last several years. Some people will complain, oh, it's an average. You could be canceling out you know, one and negative one, and you get zero. If you plot, plot it as a rolling correlation two, you see Bitcoin is range bound around 0.3 and point negative three. So it's really clo uh, uh, bound around zero, which is an extremely hard thing to find in a global economy that is increasingly correlated. Um, and this, this this is an a indication of the newness of this asset class, right? Thus far, much of the Bitcoin markets and crypto markets have not overlapped with the capital markets. And so um, we, we would expect to see some of these correlations increase over time. Um, I would posit that Bitcoin will be increasingly negatively correlated um, with equities over time as people continue to use it as a risk-off hedge against global macroeconomic dislocations, similar to how gold is used. We saw this with Brexit. We saw this with Trump's surprise election. 
when equity futures crashed, Bitcoin popped. Um, but again, very clearly distinct from the other traditional uh, capital market assets. Next, I want to dive into the risk reward profile. I'm not going to cover absolute returns. Everyone knows they've been amazing. This is volatility. And this shows um, you know, uh, decreasing volatility as a function of increasing liquidity of these markets. And there's no doubt that uh, 2017 has been a more volatile year than 2016. Um, but Bitcoin's volatility is dropping precipitously over time. And I would continue to expect it to do so as it matures. And we're seeing this with the other crypto assets as well. To give you an idea of what 2016 looked like, um, Bitcoin was just as volatile as oil and less volatile than Twitter. And that's not to say that oil and Twitter are shining stars of low volatility assets, but it's more to say if you have held those assets or similar assets in your portfolio, you have tolerated a level of volatility similar to Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty tired of, of all of the conversation around volatility. Yes, it's a vol volatile asset, but many assets that um, institutional investors and retail investors um, use within their portfolios are volatile. The question becomes, are you getting compensated for the risk you're taking? And that's where we turn to the Sharpe Ratio. So this is a graph from the original white paper. Um, so Sharpe Ratio, absolute returns minus the risk-free rate divided by the volatility. And we see Bitcoin on the left consistently stomping the other capital market assets. And what I particularly like about this graph is um, you know, people will come to me and say, oh, is it too late to buy Bitcoin? Did I, did I miss the Bitcoin boat? Blah, blah, blah. The current state of the market, um, you know, I, I don't give public investment advice. But what I will say is it's interesting to me that Bitcoin sharp ratios recently have been just as good as in the earlier years. And this is a function of decreasing volatility. Even if the absolute returns have moderated somewhat, the decreasing volatility makes it so that on a risk-adjusted basis, um, the asset has been performing well of late. So what do we have here? We have an asset class native to information networks. And I don't think this is something that I fully comprehend yet or any of us fully comprehend yet. I would think of um, crypto assets as an innovation much more akin to what equities in the early 1600s were as an innovation. They're a means to organize and incentivize human activity. Um, and unlike equities, which are a 400 year plus old instrument, crypto assets are native to information networks and information networks run our world. And so with crypto assets, we have lumped together the shareholder, the user, the management, the creators, all into one asset so that as the utility of that network grows, so too does the, does the value of the asset. Um, this is very different from equities, which have to suck profits out of the information network to justify their valuations. Lastly, where are we? Well, this looks rather scary, but I want to remind people that we used to call that a bubble. And if you go to 2013 and you look at that chart, it looks scarier than this chart. And what I would argue is this will be recursive. Each, each new bubble will make the prior bubble look tiny. And so where are we in the grand scheme of things? Uh, I use Carlotta Perez's framework of 50-year techno-economic paradigms. Um, I would say that we should look at what happened with the tech and telecom boom, where we peaked at $4 trillion inflation uh, adjusted in 2000. We're just over 5% of the way there. And so this is how I'm approaching this innovation. If you enjoyed what I talked about, you can buy my book. It's on Amazon. It's finally back in stock. Thank you for being patient with me. Uh, support a starving author. And with that, thank you very much.